Good morning, Grid Connections listeners. Today, I have the pleasure of sharing my recent interview with John Volker, a contributing editor to Car and Driver, among many other auto outlets. He's been at the forefront of hybrid and electric vehicle automotive journalism for over a decade, and he gets to share his keen insights of the electric vehicle industry's disruption of combustion vehicles with us today. In this episode, we didn't even get halfway through all the topics I wanted to cover with them, but we had, I think, the big ones and recent developments, especially in the electric vehicle space, even as recently as this past week. So exploring some of the nuances and the challenges that shape the narrative in this rapidly evolving sector, it's really great to get his take on someone who's in the industry and is a contributing writer and has a lot of influence and, more importantly, knowledge to actually contribute to what he says and be able to back it up. But John brings us not only his perspective, but also his exclusive insights from his recent test drive of the Lucid Gravity prototype, a vehicle that's sparking interest and excitement across the automotive world, especially among SUV buyers. But that's not all. We're also charging into the discussion of the state of electric vehicle charging infrastructure here in the U.S. With EV adoption accelerating, the demand for more and more advanced charging solutions is at an all-time high. John will share his expert perspective on where the U.S. stands in building a robust charging network, the challenges that lie ahead, and what this means for electric vehicle owners and potential buyers. So buckle up and tune in as we discuss today's landscape of electric vehicles from groundbreaking prototypes to the infrastructure that powers them with one of the industry's most insightful voices, John Volker. This is the Great Connections podcast where the future of mobility is always in the spotlight. And with that, enjoy. John, uh, thank you so much. If there are any listeners that are unfamiliar, can you just share a little bit of your back? Sure. Um, my so-called career has lots of lumps and bumps in it, but um... After working as a product manager for a large internet company in 2005, I realized that um, if I was ever going to make money off what was my passion, which was the auto industry, then this would be the time. The house was paid off and that. So I started freelancing in the auto journalism world, which is not how you pay the rent. And... I needed something that would set me apart from everybody else who can actually racetrack drive and has been doing this for forever. And there was really, in the mid-2000s, there was no good journalism about either hybrid cars or the nascent electric car industry. I have a friend in Detroit who I remind every few years that he said to me when I told him that was going to be my specialty, John, you're insane. The only people who care about those cars are smelly hippies, and they don't buy new cars. Um, I remind him of that every couple of years. But um, really, I thought the electrified vehicle industry, to use a problematic word, was interesting because it was the first major change in powertrains since the diesel engine. Arrived. And, you know, there was stuff on the top end of engines, but basically internal combustion cars were a known quantity with increasing refinements to meet increasing regulation. The whole idea of adding a battery and one or more electric motors was new, interesting, completely unfamiliar. And there were some articles out there that I thought I might have been able to add some information and take a different tack. And it actually sort of worked. So almost 20 years later, here I am. I have pretty deep background in the EV industry. The story I tell is that I got my first ride in a Tesla Roadster in September 2006. Wow. Uh, I think it was Roadster number three. Uh, <laughs> it's a long story. And because it only had 14% of battery left, they, they wouldn't let me drive it. I don't know if it was even a licensed production car. It had some kind of plate. But they said, we can only do one speed run because we have to run you back from Palo Alto to our garage in Redwood City. I actually have some pictures of the first Tesla shop in Redwood City. And one acceleration run from a stoplight up El Camino sort of convinced me that this was an interesting thing. And electric cars were not just glorified golf carts for hippies and everybody else. Here we are. Yeah, that's. Uh, I, I think that's really interesting because that is kind of a common experience. I think a lot of people now in the industry or what have gotten people interested into electric vehicles. But let's say, um, and there's a couple other things I want to talk about related to that, but I'm kind of curious, was that the experience kind of told you like, oh, I need to write about this? It sounds like that was actually after you had already decided, right? Um, I'd say they came about the same time. Okay. 
Um, I was knocking around trying to figure out what I wanted to do with my life. I was freelancing as a managing editor for magazines and websites. I toggle back and forth. Um, and I was always a car nerd. I mean, <laughs> you know, a lot of little boys get sports. I got cars. And so um, it was really that sort of pivot in my life where I've done a bunch of stuff. Some of it was fun. Some of it wasn't. What would I like to do? And I was lucky enough and privileged enough to be able to make that transition. And I picked something that turned out to be um, a good thing for the future. But for yeah, sure. the first Tesla ride was sort of, okay, there are hybrids out there. And frankly, every VC in Silicon Valley, where I was living at the time, um, is buying Prius. What's right. that about? Because, you know, they have BMWs and Mercedes Benzes and Audis and sometimes fancier stuff. Why are they all bringing home Priuses? And the answer was, this is the most technically advanced car in the world right now. And so, okay, Priuses, that's interesting. No one's writing about them in an interesting way. This Tesla thing I just wrote in and together it just sort of gelled. What would you say, uh, no, that, that that's really interesting. That makes a lot of sense. Cause that, uh, my exposure to it was a little bit different as we were talking about this, right. where I was actually in high school kind of building right. and racing, but right. Uh, maybe only a year and a half, I was actually down in the Bay Area, and I was also really fortunate enough to get a ride in one. Oh. And uh, <laughs> it actually was even crazier than that. Not only was it, I just wanted to go check. I was there for a work thing, and I just wanted to go check out one of the dealerships and just like see these things in the flesh. Retail and then the guy, or not dealerships. Oh uh, well, that, uh, and I, this was because uh, the one you said was in Redwood City. I want to say this one was in Menlo Park. Yeah, yeah I, the Menlo I, Park I location. It was on the east side of El Camino. And it had that, it was the weird kind of like a tagonal, uh, little shaped, uh, I guess, retail location with a service thing attached to it. Right. And so I, I was just kind of looking around and maybe because I was just in a suit for a meeting I had been in. Oh. Uh, the guy there was just like, do you want to test drive it? And I was like, well, I would love to, but I don't think this is the right thing. He's like, oh, here's the keys. Go, go for a drive. Right. And I, at the time, I think was 20 and I just couldn't, I don't know. I mean, I, I think anywhere else in the world, they probably would have been like, get the hell out of here. But I think just once again, the Bay area and to some extent, Tesla has always been kind of good about test drives like that. But I think they just like, oh, it's probably just some other, uh, tech millionaire who just, sold something that like, yeah, he can probably afford it. Whereas like I was trying to figure out how to pay student loans and all these, my rent for that month, but it was hard to turn down that opportunity and kind of the same experience. It kind of closed any questions or any doubt in my mind that electric vehicles have a strong future. Nice. I just wasn't sure at that time if it was going to be Tesla or some other company. And clearly they felt they had followed through and everyone else is now trying to catch up with it. But uh, following up on that, what was kind of the point that you realized, I'm sure for a long time, and I, I mean, I've even read this and seen this where people are kind of doubting you or uh, not believing that this is the future. What were ever an article you read or a moment in the industry that kind of was the point where you felt like things had flipped and people were like no longer doubting that like, oh, it's going to be the EV stuff. And you kind of knew you had made the right choice to be the person focused on EVs or <laughs> do you... To be, it's do you think question. the industry is still going through this? Yeah. No. Um, yeah. Let's be clear. In 2024, the EV transition is unstoppable. Okay. Yeah. There will be lumps and bumps. Sometimes the curve won't go like this. It may go like this. Maybe it'll go like this for a while. Um, the US and North America are not leading the charge. We are, in fact, global laggards, um, both because we use vehicles differently and because we have had, we're not good at industrial policy. Um, China is by far the leader. They want to use electric vehicles to essentially crush the rest of the world's auto industry. Um, and Europe is well ahead of North America at this point. So it's going to happen. It will be a transition that lasts well beyond my lifetime. There, depending on whose numbers you use, there's between 1.3 and 1.6 billion vehicles on the planet. The average car in the US on US roads is now almost 13 years old. That's a transition that takes a generation, if not two or three. But electric cars are now viable and practical in a way that they simply weren't 10 years ago. 
the um, 10 years to the day after the first leaf was sold in the US. So basically December 2020, I guess. I did an article that said, look where we've come in 10 years. That leaf had 74 miles of range, ideally. <laughs> right. Um, it had 50 kilowatt fast charging, which then was remarkable. Um, and it was a somewhat peculiar looking C-segment hatchback, compact hatch, not a form factor Americans tend to buy. And at that point in December, 2010, Tesla only had the Roadster. They'd gone through a recall because they essentially blew up the transmit, the two-speed transmissions that they had fitted. Um, the Model S was a promise that everybody sort of sneered at. And now in December, 2020, you had pickup trucks coming, you had a variety of SUV formats and 200 miles was the minimum acceptable range on the vast majority of EVs in the market. And 300 was coming. Um, think what we'll be in December 2030, right? Batteries improve at 8% a year, improving cost performance. And we saw some of that from 2010 to 2020. We will see the same thing in 2020 to 20, assisted by at least one new battery chemistry. It's not new, but we will have lithium iron phosphate batteries coming into the U.S. market, which they largely haven't so far because they're cheaper, albeit less energy dense, but everything's improving. So lithium iron phosphate batteries will in fact be practical for that 200 plus mile uh, electric car. So I'm not worried about the transition stopping. To get back to the question you asked me five minutes ago, <laughs> there wasn't one single eureka moment. There wasn't that point where I was sitting staring at a screen and the light bulb <laughs> went off. I think it was really the um, the combination of a few things. The data on lifetime CO2 footprint per mile of electric cars became conclusive that they had lower lifetime CO2. And it continued to improve as the grid decarbonized because an electric car has lower and lower CO2 if it's charged on cleaner and cleaner power. Um, and the, the uh, Union of Concerned Scientists has a great US map that I've written about for 10 years, which started out being, well, you may not want to drive an EV in these areas of the states, drive a Prius instead. Now, you know, at worst, you're almost equal to a Prius. And at best, right. it's miles a gallon equivalent. So it was the CO2 data. It was GM's board deciding that Tesla was actually a threat. That happened 10 years ago. Um, and overall, it was the continuing consumer enthusiasm. And at least among early adopters, the fact that people really liked their cars and did not want to go back. Some people still have. I think at the moment we're at this funny sort of trough between the early adopters and early mass adoption. Um, we can get to that a little bit later. But um, as of probably about three or four years ago, I no longer have any worries that electric cars are going to fall off a cliff and we won't we won't transition. We will. But it won't be done until long after I depart. Well, hopefully that will be quite a ways away. But I, I see I what... I'm covering long life. Has to go. <laughs> I share that hope. But... <laughs> well, and I, I think it's funny. Um, every, already there's a couple of things just kind of thinking back. You, you talk about like Silicon Valley and being there with the first Priuses. And it just kind of even reminds me of one of the big things, especially kind of the early 2010s was people were getting Priuses and then they were going to shops to essentially convert them to plug-in hybrids. And you're starting to, I mean, obviously it costs a lot of money, but it was, it was exactly that thing where people were seeing this as being the future. And it was so fascinating to me that clearly it was definitely an early adopter part of the market, but the fact that there were people buying brand new Priuses and then taking to a shop to spend like another five to 10 grand to make them plug in hybrids so they could have kind of the best of both worlds for the commutes, depending on the situation. It was one of those kind of things also to me that also like still like, obviously there is a market demand and need for this. And it was surprising. Yeah. And, and obviously the ideal situation was to get to the fully electric thing. But back then, fast charging wasn't even an idea. It was like, maybe you could use... These, there's a Chatamo thing that kind of works here and there. 
Um, but it was it was almost the concept that plug-in vehicles would be for around town and you just have like a hybrid for longer drives. And it's so wild to think about. I can't remember how much that has changed. And Actually, using... that's still Toyota's view today, frankly. Well, but, um, that, that is true. Yeah. The plug-in Prius movement was a tiny, tiny, tiny percentage of people who bought Priuses. Your earliest adopters were in Silicon Valley and California because gasoline is really expensive in California. Yeah always has been. But then the rest of the world decided, okay, yeah, it looks kind of strange, but you know what? I get 45 to 50 miles a gallon, no matter what I do to the damn thing, that's better than the 22 miles a gallon that a similar shaped car that isn't a hybrid gets. I'm going to do that. And right. like electric cars, your friends, your coworkers, your neighbors, your relations, all as one of them got, you'd ask questions, you'd realize it was sort of normal. It was a real car. Same process happens for electric cars, but the change for electric cars is bigger. Remember that there's a lot of people that still think hybrids have to plug in. As for the plug-in hybrid thing, several members of your audience are going to um, smile because I am on record as being not a skeptic. Plug-in hybrids work really beautifully if people plug them in. And right. the car Although we had data from the last decade from GM and Ford about their plug-in hybrids and how many miles were accomplished on grid power, we do not have that data this decade. And the makers of the two biggest selling plug-in hybrids in the U.S., this is 18 months old now, which are Jeep with its 4 yeah. by e Wrangler and Toyota with its RAV4 Prime and Prius Prime, will not say exactly what percentage of miles are covered on grid power, even though they have that data. Jeep did finally tell a Detroit reporter at least half of its 4 by e owners plug in at least once a month. This is not a ringing endorsement of the large amounts of subsidies we have given to plug-in hybrids. And I remain to be convinced until I see proper data that people are actually plugging in their plug-in hybrid. End of lecture, and several people in your audience have seen that already. Well, no, no there's uh, we got There's so many things I want to cover, but uh, well, it, it's funny you bring that up because one, uh, we had John McElroy of Autoline on previously oh. and kind of go into exactly, and he said this on his show too, but exactly what you're saying about the whole hybrid phenomenon. The whole concept would be so much better marketed and you get so many more people to buy hybrids if you just said, it's, this isn't a hybrid. This is just a car that gets you 50 miles a gallon. And this is a car that gets you 20 miles a gallon. Like there's partially there's now even the politicization and the stigma of hybrid, but oh. exactly what you're talking about. More people are just interested in how do I spend less at the pump versus even horsepower. Uh, some of the other things that I think more car focused people kind of think is what's going to be the big thing that sets cars apart. Well, I think and, the Prius taught the industry a lot, uh, at least one for sure. really bad lesson which was, if you have a technically advanced car, it has to look weird, or in the words of Detroit, a science project. Now, there were very good reasons they designed the Prius that way, aerodynamics, aerodynamics, right. and aerodynamics. But um, one of the reasons the first Nissan Leaf came out the way it did was taking that lesson that it has to be distinctive looking in order to tell people. You'll note that Prius sales have fallen off a cliff there are 20 or 30,000 a year, I think. Um, that's because you can now get a Toyota Corolla hybrid, relatively right. the same packaging within a few miles a gallon and no one knows. I think that's a great point. And then even going to the plug-in hybrid stuff, there's really good data coming out of Europe where yep. they were showing that, especially for company, uh, they, they were offering, uh, maybe, maybe this was just in the UK, but they were essentially offering incentives for companies to give out hybrids as a work vehicle. And so many people would just not only get a plug-in hybrid, but they'd also get a gas card. So there was never really an incentive for them to actually plug it in on a regular basis. They're not paying for it either way. They just use the gas card and not have to worry about charging. Um, right. But I will say there is something ironically vexing when you do see a plug-in hybrid charging, even if I don't need to charge at like a free level two charging thing, that it is rare, but it also just seems like, why, why are you doing it? I, I don't know. We, I know. This is going to veer dangerously yeah. close into religious belief. Next topic. Exactly. Exactly. Totally. Um, with that, 
You know, one of the things that I think is really interesting about your background is you actually have an engineering degree. Mm-hmm. And I feel like so many people in the automotive space, especially when it comes to electric vehicles, really struggle with seeing what the value or even the advantage to an electric vehicle is. And I think if you approach it or kind of have an understanding of engineering as you kind of go into the conversation, it really gives you a strong foundation of the value. And then you can actually essentially educate others pretty quickly as to what the value and the advantage of going to an electric vehicle is, whether that be financial, whether that be performance, yada, yada, yada. What I'm kind of curious about as someone who is in a, a journalist in the space and has a lot of influence, do you think more auto journalists should have really have almost be required to have like an engineering degree or some sort of kind of background like that? Because I, I have been consistently disappointed by auto journalists in their ability to effectively cover electric vehicles. And I'd be kind of curious as someone who's really working in that space and has a lot of exposure to that on your own, uh, for your thoughts on that. I'm not sure I can speak for the whole panoply of sure. auto journalists. Um, there is an entire category of video journalists. And honestly, I don't have enough time to watch someone talk yeah. about a specific car for 12 minutes or 60 minutes with a couple of exceptions. Kyle. But um, for sure, you know, I would say more of the auto journalists I know have an engineering or technical background than journalists at large. Certainly not the majority, I don't think, but um, especially at Car and Driver, where I've been lucky enough to go to some of their 10 best testing and basically hang out and BS with the staff in between drive loops. Um, there's a fairly high degree of mechanical awareness. The issue is mechanical because there are a lot of ME, a lot of them came out of SAE Formula Racing Series or have built their own cars. Um, The the, uh, quirky ones do lemons racing. But, um, you know, it's an electric vehicle is a fundamentally different thing. And it's still got suspension and electric windows and seats and infotainment and all that stuff. But all of the powertrain stuff is totally different. It's a battery electric vehicle. That is a different skill set. And I think the field of auto journalism has gotten much, much better in about the last four or five years. Um, I could be found to grumble. I grumble a lot Um, pretty much through the 2010s. But things have really stepped up and... I'm now seeing some some pretty sophisticated analyses from the more general automotive press. So it's getting better. It's a process. You know, nationally, electric cars are still only 8% of sales last year, of right. which was about 2% plug-in hybrids, 6% battery electrics. So, you know, there are more cars that are turbocharged sold every year than there are electric cars last year. So it's a... It's a process. It's an evolution. There's also the issue that first and foremost, as a journalist, you got to be able to tell stories. And, you know, I've had the odd young journalist come to me and say, what do you know, what do I need to do? Right. You know, how do I write a good story? And and, uh, unfortunately, the flip line is it gets a lot easier after the first 5,000. I wrote 4,600 stories in nine years running green car reports and I edited another 7,500. So you know, after a while, it's kind of like riding a bicycle, I like to think. But it's getting better. Auto journalists should have technical awareness. Um, and those who race drive, which is a minority, but those who are actually good on track generally have a much greater understanding of how cars act. Yeah, and I, I guess I, I didn't mean it to sound so pessimistic. And I, I would also agree with you. It has definitely come a long ways and been more positive. Mm-hmm. I just kind of feel like um, some of it is definitely... Uh, education and the efficiency in conveying the message and value of electric vehicles. But I also do find that there is, I don't want to say it's generational either, but there is a really interesting, I guess, value disconnect or understanding the value for the consumer. I mean, I hate to use it as the example, but I think a big one would be Tesla, where it's like so much of it is through the app. And I think a lot of like traditional car people, Mm. that kind of makes them cringe and they think of it as an appliance and I can kind of get that. But for the average person who thinks of their car 
as an appliance or as a convenience or as a just a mode of transportation and not really something they see for passion. You can kind of look at this with not even Tesla, I think any of the EV startups, but especially the Chinese automakers. Mm -hmm. This is where I think there is a big disconnect between a lot of the traditional automotive outlets. Mm -hmm. And and I think to some extent it could be generational buyer values. I would say kind of my I know some people older, so it's obviously very anecdotal, but like age group wise and younger, there is a lot about like kind of that Tesla app experience that draws people to EVs and car brands once they even know that that's an option. And I think if, the, if this makes sense, and I think there's a lot in that um, value that these car brands are presenting to buyers that... I've just noticed that traditional automotive journalists are either mystified by or don't think it's really a big selling point. And I think if it got more press, it might also understand why like consumer preferences and some of the changes and why Tesla and some of these other EV companies have been selling EVs so well in the fact that it has become what is considered, I think, to some as almost gimmicky is now almost considered a luxury feature that is presented with a lot of electric vehicles. And I, I know I can speak of that to when it, like when I had to um, get the tires changed on my car because I, the Les Schwab was backed up for months. I was able to just do it through the app for our Tesla. And there was a guy there two days later who did it in the driveway. Mm -hmm. And maybe just short of a McLaren, I don't know any other services that will could just come right to you. And I, I think when people, sure. I know other people just kind of like my age group, when they hear that, like, oh, I want to get that. And I realize mm -hmm. that's kind of a, another level and there's price mediums to it, but it, it is just interesting to me. And maybe this isn't so much as a question as just a comment about, it is fascinating to me that value as a lot of auto journalists are, their role is to show like why to buy a car over another, the whole spectrum of EV ownership mm -hmm. that I don't know if it's getting the right coverage or the right message to consumers to make a fully informed choice, if that makes sense. Okay. There's a there's a lot There's like 12 there. billion things to unpack there. And so maybe this has just become its own podcast. So yeah, I don't want to cool. go down too much of a rabbit hole there. I guess a few basics. Yeah. The data show that most people view their cars as a mix of appliance. And it's the fascinating yeah. thing about covering cars. There's this highly functional aspect. I have a second kid, so it has to have three rows. And, you know, it has to have at least umpty -ump cup holders and... What do you mean there's only two USB ports in the rear seat? Stuff, really functional stuff. And the not all that well understood psychographic stuff about what a car signifies to the outside society about you. And some people don't care about that, but some people care a lot. There was this wonderful article, and I'm going back 20 years, comparing minivans to SUVs. Because 20 years ago, the buyer pools demographically were almost identical. Hmm. Slightly above average household income. They both had two kids. They lived in certain types of suburbs predominantly. But psychographically, as the Brits would say, chalk and cheese. Because the minivan owners are like, this vehicle is amazing. It has incredible room inside. I can carry anything. I can carry the kids and grandma. It's got all these great features. The sliding doors are really great. And the other side is like, oh my God, what would people think of me if they saw me in a minivan? Patui. And those are very different psychographics, right? Most people are somewhere in this mix of it's got to have A, B, and C, but it also has to say something about me. And you saw that double-edged sword most acutely with the Prius where mm -hmm. it became a joke. Um, <clears throat> one of my relations still calls them the Toyota Pius. And that yeah. was a South Park joke from 20 years ago, I think. So the idea that a vehicle is an appliance is important when you move from the early adopters to the mass market. And yeah. to quote the invaluable Chelsea Sexton, who is now working for the government. So we haven't heard a lot from her lately. First right. and foremost, you've got to be able to sell an electric car as a better car. Never mind the environment, never mind the apps, never mind any of that stuff. It has to be sold as a better car and they are better cars. They're quieter. 
they have punchier acceleration from a stop and even your aunt going to church kind of likes winning the stoplight Grand Prix now and then. Right. And, you know, they have a lot of things. Plus, for that minority of Americans who have dedicated off-street parking, you can charge it at home overnight. It's, you never have to go to a gas station, which it turns out about half the world kind of likes. And it's much cheaper per mile. Those are all good things. They're just nicer to travel in. Uh, the challenge is going to be charging for people in multiple unit dwellings which is going to be a bigger issue two years from now once a huge slew of used EVs with practical ranges, Tesla Model 3s, start hitting the market. We'll put that one aside. But first and foremost, auto journalists, with the exception of Consumer Reports, which has its own slant, and a couple of other outlets are not looking at it from the straight consumer point of view. They're looking at it from the point of view of auto enthusiasts. And so automatically, that audience of auto journalists, um, especially if they're associated full-time with a specific outlet, is going to bring some perception about who they're writing for as compared to the public at large. Right. Because I've been freelancing for so long, I do both kinds. I do, you know, geeky stuff on battery chemistries, and I also do really basic explainers. Car and driver, bless their hearts, was shocked how well their explainers did. How does a hybrid work? Yeah. A hybrid is not an electric car that you plug in, you know, and stuff like that. Um, Because there is, and one of the things that I take away from that is that the interest in articles like that, a lot of those articles are created from search queries now. You know, what do people go on to car and driver and look for? But the fact that they get such traffic indicates to me that a much broader pool of people are now at least educating themselves. Thinking about it, yeah. Yeah. And uh, this this will be the last question kind of in, oh, tangential to all this, God. but yeah. is uh, I, I, I totally get what you're saying about uh, the focus on automotive enthusiasts. And that's really cool and interesting to see and it makes sense that there's a larger interest kind of in the more general thing. And is that just kind of because the old kind of business thing that's like 20% of a customer base is going to be 80% of your business that you think for a lot of these traditional automotive outlets that they just kind of focus on the enthusiast because that's going to be the main subscriber. That's going to be where they get the most of their revenue usually. It depends. Any media yeah. outlet these days is a mix of regular readers and what I call drive-bys, which are yeah, the yeah. people who search for something on Google and get an article popped up. If uh, parenthetically, and I'll leave this to one sentence, If, in fact, Google goes full tilt into AI and starts answering all your questions for yourself on the first screen, many, many media. Sure, yeah. (laughs) Um, So um, your ma or your uncle Fred, who has driven pickup trucks all his life, or pick your stereotype, probably doesn't subscribe to Car and Driver. And Car and Driver knows what its audience is. It's a mix of what will people regularly read for the ones that get the daily email or the daily push or the alerts on their phone versus what's the stuff that our search data says people really want to know from us. Right. I uh, know. I, I appreciate that. And uh, I appreciate the insights on that. So we'll, we'll get to some other topics. I know that you're interested in talking a little bit more about. So uh, I know you recently had the chance to test drive the Lucid Gravity prototype. What can you share about that? And I know from what I've seen, just kind of like on Twitter and a couple other things, you seem to be a really big fan of just the Lucid cars in general. Um, if you could just share kind of your thoughts on the the brand, the cars, and what this recent prototype experience was like. Sure. Um, I, was, I was lucky to be offered that chance. It came with a number of caveats. <laughs> yeah. No freeway time because the car doesn't have airbags and their lawyers got mm. very antsy. Um, and it didn't have air suspension. So really my comments on the suspension were limited to a small box and yeah. I had about an hour with it. But that said, I had actually seen the demonstrator version, the fully built version of the gravity and was quite impressed in December. Um, I'm fond of lucid because they have very smart engineers and they have really packaged their drivetrain an extremely powerful drivetrain in a very small space 
and they're actually they have a side gig selling that powertrain to other makers. Aston Martin has announced it's going to use Lucid powertrains. So I think that speaks to the essential quality of their designs. Um, for those people who may not know, the CEO of Lucid was the lead engineer on the Tesla Model S. Um, the company no longer says it. In fact, they don't mention the T word at all, ever. But um, at one point in their evolution, one of their employees told me about the Lucid. We want to make the Tesla Model S done right. So there you have it. Um, I like their vehicles. I, part of it is design. Um, Derek Jenkins, their lead designer, at one point said, we wanted to make a car that wasn't shouty. Shouty is a British term meaning essentially brash, yeah. obvious, loud, you know, noticeable. And I think they pulled that off. Rarely the person to talk to about interiors, but I love some of their fabrics, um, surprisingly. And um, overall, I just... I will never turn down a chance to drive a Lucid because it is such a nice driving experience. Um, the power of their powertrain is demonstrated. I haven't driven a Lucid Air Sapphire, but let's let's set the base here. This is about a two and a half ton, more or less, four seat luxury sedan that will accelerate you from zero to 60 miles an hour in less than two seconds. Right. I'm not sure I actually want to experience that at my age, but my, <laughs> uh, my colleague Dan at Car and Driver um, wrote one of the more glowing reviews I have seen in the outlet of the car because it's really everything that car people would like. And it's totally tractable for everyday use as well. It's kind of like you can have performance that leaves Ferraris in the dust. Um, but you can also have this very nice luxurious sedan that you can drive around and do your regular life. So Lucid's problem is that because they had a funding hiatus um, and everything just sort of froze and they re-engineered quietly on the side, um, they didn't launch with an SUV, unlike Rivian, who launched with a pickup truck more or less at the same time. They launched with a luxury sedan, which in 2012 was fine for the Tesla Model S, but by yeah. the time 2020 rolled around, luxury sedans were a declining category. So I think the SUV is going to be the one that really takes them to the next level. But they are also talking about their mid-sized project, which is going to be a smaller SUV. You can really think of it as their Tesla Model Y competitor. They showed one draped shape, right. no real information. But I'm looking forward to that one because... That's a car that arguably I might be able to afford. And I really like their engineering. Yeah, I, I uh, have always been really impressed with their engineering. Personally, the styling of it, I have not been as big of a fan of. Okay. But I know plenty of people that like them. And I'm kind of the more the merrier. And I, like I said, I, I think the engineering aspect, especially with a focus on efficiency, is something that uh, Tesla started with and did really well. And it's great to see Lucid kind of taking it even further. And I think it's something that more automakers, especially from kind of the traditional brands, really need to put a focus on just to really kind of get the best value and the best distance and range out of and the most out of a battery pack. So I, I really do think, uh, like you said, the team there is doing some really oppressive things. And I myself haven't been able to drive the Sapphire either, but everyone I've talked to just does seem to they won't stop talking about it. They and start to drool down the Exactly. Side of the and as much as the, and it's not like it's a bad design. It's just not a design that kind of, I guess, I, I get what you're saying. Like, I would say the original Model S was kind of like an understated, but nice mm -hmm. design. The Porsche Taycan might be a little bit more of that kind of brash and stand out. I like that design. The Lucid Ooh, for me. Yeah. I, I love the Taycan. I mean. Yeah. Yeah. I would take an, you know, in the world where I had money. I would right, take exactly. air, um over a Taycan just because the Taycan is really cramped. But it, on the Taycan yep. test drive, it took all of 90 seconds to realize that the car had more acceleration and more road holding than I had courage, which is fine. <laughs> <laughs> and the numbers coming out of this recent refresh Taycan are just absurd from the charging standpoint. Um, and as someone who has road trip, I mean, our daily is a Model Y and it's it's a it's kind of like what I've come to say is like, that's like the baseline. If it can't charge as fast or do these things, I can't think about for the next car. Cause 
I've driven from Bend, Oregon to Phoenix, Arizona in a day, which is just a shy bit under miles. And it's a long day. <laughs> um, but a big part is having a really good charging curve, good speeds and stuff like that. And it could be better, but yeah, it's just one of those things that uh, I know we had kind of agreed to talk about getting into the charge uh, to charging space. But what, what else? Yeah. Okay. And so, um, yeah, I think in my dream situation, it would be the new Porsche Taycan if we're talking about cars with unlimited money and then be able to charge it on the supercharger network. And that would be like the ultimate road tripping vehicle. But there was a big announcement this week. And I'm still not 100% sure how to pronounce it. Is it Ayana? Do you know, John? No idea. I, I call it Ayana, but... Yeah. Uh, I, I think that has been the consensus for most people trying to describe it. But it is the, I guess, next step in the seven different automakers that last year said that they were going to come out with this charging network. And they are Mercedes, Stellantis, Ford, Kia, Hyundai, and I know I'm dropping a couple BMW. others. BMW. Yeah. Yeah, I'm missing one too. But, um, well, and this is where I'm afraid I'd put in a plug. I did a four-part series uh, last fall for Charged EVs mm. magazine. Uh, yeah, so I actually rather that. It's called Charging is Changing. There's four parts to it to make it readable, but I encourage anyone. I'll say a few high points, but if you really want to dig in... Um, I, I was surprised at the favorable reception on what is effectively a sort of a nerdy aspect to, to the EV thing. But I think broadly for charging, I have been quite disappointed in North America, in the entire auto industry outside Tesla, which fell back on its 100-year history of outsourcing fueling to John right. D. Rockefeller and just sort of assumed that a nationwide charging infrastructure of some sort would magically appear. Um, <laughs> it's actually from the hydrogen field, but one of my favorite quotes is a Toyota exec who said, well, you know, it would be so much easier to sell the Mirai, a hydrogen fuel cell vehicle only available in California, if a hydrogen fueling cell infrastructure manifested itself. Yeah, well, you know, fueling and charging infrastructure don't manifest themselves. You got to spend a lot of money. Tesla knew that. They did a superb job of it within the constraint of only having to charge four vehicles. And right. if you design right. all the charging station hardware and all four vehicles and the software on both ends, that is a, a manageable thing. I want to say that while I understand why Farley at Ford did the deal with Tesla to give Ford's access to the supercharger network, followed two or three weeks later by GM and I think very Yeah. Um, whether and how that works is very much yet to be determined. I have seen some things from commentators who ought to know better, who have said the charging wars are over, the whole problem has been solved, Tesla has won, every other driver will see how Tesla, how great Teslas are. That is entirely possible. We are far from that time. And here's why. Um, Tesla is able to understand and constantly adjust both ends of the charging equation because it knows what's going on inside its battery packs. When a non-Tesla pulls up to a supercharger, um, that car maker is not particularly going to want to lay bare all of its battery protection algorithms and the rest of the software that controls its EV, let alone give Tesla access to its customers, their addresses, their VINs, for sure, and all of the rest. So there are some really hard negotiations going on right about now with Tesla and all of its different partners about, well, no, we need to know A, B, and C. No, actually, we're not going to give you that. How it all remains, yet to be determined. I will be surprised if the majority of non-Teslas charge at, as fast at supercharger as Teslas do under the same circumstances. I hope I am pleasantly surprised. It could happen. Well, once again, uh, you've brought up about 12 different things that I want to talk about or kind of remind you of. First, just real quickly, you probably saw it when you talk about hydrogen. And then earlier this week, the 
I think it was Shell who had like only seven hydrogen stations, but made up like a third of the actual hydrogen fueling stations in California. Yep. yep. They said, eh, we're not going to do this anymore. Right. And right, my right. model for that was in the Pacific Northwest, I think it was actually Seattle. Um, right. You may remember that for about 15 years, Honda sold a natural gas city. Because natural gas is arguably one of the few fuels that you can swap into a combustion car. No one was ever able to figure out a way where people with natural gas service at home could fuel at home right. as electric car owners do. Because the compressor required to get to, is it 300 PSI, I think? I forget. I, I may have that totally wrong. Um, is a large industrial compressor that you don't want running in your garage. Yeah. Um, so as a result, all the natural gas civic owners had to drive to a place and fuel up. And indeed, all, uh, the Seattle area had, I think, four. And three of them ended up just shutting down. People with natural gas civics had essentially door stops because they couldn't fuel. Them. So the hydrogen thing, just not that surprising, which is why I think you could buy a Mirai. I hope not very many people did, except as a curio, because yeah. Toyota will take them all back and crush them. Yep. <laughs> I think that's about all we have to say on that. I mean, there was just a lot even around the infrastructure. I know a lot of natural gas companies have been talking about trying to go to hydrogen, but even then, uh, just the physics of a hydrogen atom compared to the natural gas, there's so much you have to do to retrofit to even make it work. I just don't see that scaling too much. To be clear, the problem with hydrogen cars is not the car. I have every confidence that right. over time, the good engineers at Toyota and Honda can make a hydrogen fuel cell, tanks, power electronics, small battery, and all the rest of it that will package into where you used to have an internal combustion engine with certain adjustments. That's not the problem. The problem right. is the fueling infrastructure. And the good citizens of California have spent over $100 million for what was supposed to be hydrogen stations by December. I think it was more than that. I think there was, I think there's another comment in it now over the last decade, but, um, anyway, yeah, no, I, I, I yeah. think that's, let's, my let's, hydrogen, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Done with for cars. Yeah. But, um, kind of, I, I think it's also really interesting what you talk about, especially around data and the different cars, because the OEMs have kind of learned this the hard way through the infotainment space with Apple CarPlay, with Android auto, with just the amount of data that had to kind of go out to these systems about their cars currently that I, I think you're probably right. There is a high likelihood that um, there probably will be a, definitely a pullback. But I mean, I, what I, I wouldn't say I'm more bullish on it, but I, I do think that there is, it'll, it'll be interesting to see what Tesla requires. But now that it is like the J3400 standard, it has become a little bit more clear as to what information the car will be giving. And um, there's obviously the opportunity that the car could give the wrong information, but when you look at just the existing public charging networks and the cars being able to tell those what they need, depending on the thing that I think is usually the bigger issue. And my big thing about electric vehicles for them to take off has always been, um, you look at this at any disruption for something to take off. It doesn't have to be just as good. It has to be better. And one of the big things like with a Tesla, you just plug and walk away and it just does it. I have tried that with other cars and other charging networks. And I think only one time that it, the plug-in thing actually worked. I think that will change. And I know that that's something that allegedly Ford's trying to do with this Tesla deal. But yeah, um, I, I agree with you. There's there's still a lot that has to be figured out and like actually even clarified because there's been a lot of rumors as to whether it's actually doing that or not or what is the, the facts of what will be the option. What are you trying to say or look up right now, John? So two points. The first yeah. one is you mentioned SAE uh, 3400, which is the Tesla um, standard. Right. Next, they called it well before it was a standard, but it is a standard now, so I will call it next. Yeah. Um, my understanding is that by and large, SAE 3400 version one, which is what we have now, was essentially the phone board that Tesla dropped on the table plus explanations they had to give the committee to fill in parts that weren't adequately specified. I think the interesting thing with the North American charging standard is going to come when the next round of changes is requested. 
by all the car makers around the table and how Tesla will react. This leads to the issue that car makers are not psyched about the idea that one of their main and most successful EV competitors is actually controlling the fueling for their customers. Um, they very much dislike that idea. And that is really where IANA came from. Right. But it also um, reflects the idea that if you get past early adopters who are, in fact, comfortable with driving into a prison lit Walmart parking lot in the rain at midnight yeah. and screwing with the app till they get the one charging cable that works. And I, or, I mean, who, who doesn't know, want to drive their $250,000 Lucid Air or Tycon into a... Yeah. The EQS. Right there well, with you. you yep. got to have a better experience. I've For several years, I've said, look, EV charging has to be at least as pleasant as your average gas station, which has canopies, by the way. Oh, for sure. For sure. The canopies are not there to protect customers. That's a nice side effect. They're there to hide all the fire suppression stuff, but yeah. they protect the customers. So Iona came from that. But it also came from this idea that Tesla can't control the entire North American charging network. That would be a very bad thing. And finally, I want to say what, when I started to research that four-part series, Charging is Changing, what came up over and over again was the fury and the rage among automakers at Electrify America in particular. Supposedly the reason that Farley at Ford did the deal with Tesla was because he had called the then CEO of Electrify America and essentially said, you are more than half of the reason that all of our Mach-E customers are failing to charge, you know, fix this thing now. And essentially it didn't get fixed to the degree that Ford felt. So Ford was primed for this is not good enough. In some ways, I think Ford is more attuned to the actual driving and customer experience. Although GM has gotten very silent lately. I have my first right. interview with a GM person in a while this week. But, um, you know, IANA is going to theoretically make a nicer experience. I think it's funny that uh, Electrify America rolled out its uh, sort of flagship charging station entirely indoors, which is interesting, but not yes. something we can do. Um, this week when I announced, I'm sure it was just a coincidence. Coincidence has happened. Um, of course. But the last point I want to make is you talked about plug and charge, which is the non-Tesla way of plugging in and walking away. I have now experienced plug and charge because I checked for it on the Ford Mach-E, the Ford F-150 Lightning, the Porsche Tycon, yep. um, the Mercedes-Benz EQS, the Lucid Air, and I may be forgetting one other, uh, maybe another car from one of those brands. I can't remember. But um, it does exist when both sides of the party wanted to. Electrify right. America had to bring it up on its stations. I gather EVgo is going to do some of that as well, but no question at all that plug it in and walk away is the only viable way to do it, along with routing you between charging stations. And that is starting to happen as well um, to very varying degrees among different car makers. Worth noting here that Hyundai pushed an over-the-air update to various of its electric cars that added that function to its in-dash now. So they are getting it, albeit not on a schedule that I think a lot of us would right. Um, no, and I, I think it's, I, I guess one of the things I always try to do is like approach a lot of these conversations and technologies from the point of the consumer. Yeah. And it's really easy. It's not fun, but it's easy to just go to a gas station, you swipe your card, you put it in, yeah. it works. Yeah. And the current status of EV chargers is not that, especially the public fast chargers. And even when you've been having to use like a Tesla magic dock thing, you have to get the app and that's, and I just don't think that experience is good. I know that's going to change with some of these, some of these new, uh, uh, pedestals and charging pedestals that they're bringing out. But I am hopeful that plug in charge does become a more universal thing because you're right. It is, it is a 
two um, sided. You have to have the car talking and then you have to have the actual charging thing talking with each other effectively. And that and has been often a third party validation for whatever payment mechanism exists. Exactly. Whether that's at yep. the car maker or a bank or what have you. Or yeah. And that, that, that is kind of the yeah. thing then that takes plug and charge to the next level is then it has to confirm the account yep. uh, and all the account information. But I, I really do think that that is something that needs to be figured out and become that will be one of those things that everyone I've talked to that is not a car or EV person, but is kind of like curious in getting an EV. It's those kinds of things. They're like, oh, okay, I don't have to think about it. It just, I do it like once I put in my credit card info and it just works. I get that. I can do that. Um, and I'm kind of cautiously hopeful <laughs> that that will be more of the case because I do think one other thing, um, we haven't heard much about this, but I, I know one of the things that Tesla has, has really put a focus on that has kind of made their charging system uh, effective is one, they have the scale of it, but two, it's throughput is a big thing for them. and something that they measure. And that's where I do see that I, I kind of get what you're saying about there not being the same speeds, but for them, in my exposure and talking to people that work there, like their interest is they there's some interest, obviously, in what car it's charging, but they just want to get that car through so they can get another one in charging. Oh, absolutely. And one of the things that frustrates me about all the non-Tesla makers that are selling EVs, which is pretty much everybody except maybe right. Honda, um, is their absolute and utter inability, despite all sorts of PR blather, to educate the buyers of these vehicles. And a yeah. lot of that is down to our valued partners, the independently owned and operated third-party franchise dealership networks. Because, you know, car dealers, the, the less good ones, have sales staff turnover approaching 50% a year. Right. And so, you know, I hear an immense amount from the car makers about, oh, but we have training or we give the guy an iPad. Yeah. Like, so my favorite dealer in North America is Bourgeois Chevrolet in a that's just a great name remote part of Quebec. Yeah. Um, oh, here we go. It, love those guys. I, I was actually, I think, I was on a roadmap panel with one of them at one point. This is going back. That's so long. funny. But um, they at one point sold something like half of all the EVs in Canada and the wow. majority of the EVs in Quebec which is really the California of Canada in terms yeah, of it. Yeah. And the way they did it was by giving a Chevy Volt to every new salesperson and dealership employee and saying, hmm. go home, take it home for two weeks. You know, this is how you plug it in. This is the charging cord. Here's how it works. Not even level two, just the regular charger. And for two weeks, people got it. They suddenly realized, oh, it's a regular car, but I never have to go to a gas station. I can plug it in. That's really inexpensive because uh, electricity in Quebec is cheap and it's a municipally or uh, provincially owned electric utility. So people mm. are sort of, it's our utility. You're right, you're um, right. And gasoline's really expensive, relatively, kind of like California, except the utility part. And so um, people just got it and they became the best and most effective salespeople for electric cars in a place, you know, a less dense part of Quebec that is not necessarily your ideal EV use case, given the weather. Right. Okay. So most automakers can't do that. They don't have the interest. They don't have the dedication, despite what they will tell me. And as a result, the dealerships remain the weak point on education. Your point to Tesla throughput, Tesla owners have educated each other, right? You know, you get there. You see it's 80 cent and you tell the guy, hey, it's going to take a really long time for you to get the next 5%. This is where you leave. If Tesla, had, the car hasn't already told that person. I think that's a big part of it. And that's from what I understand, what I am hearing, which I completely agree with you, is there's a huge asterisk around that. Allegedly, I, I saw one of these quotes and it was uh, Farley on, I think, CNBC or something. But the idea is... They plan to, as part of this deal, include a lot of the actual information and software in their software, like Tesla does when you roll up to a charging thing. Yeah. Whether I, that I happens or not, or to what level, but that would be huge. And that does do a lot of this for you. But yeah. what, what were you going to say? Oh, I was just going to say, I'm a big fan of the Chevy Bolt EV. If they had yeah. an all-wheel drive version, which it was clearly designed for, I would probably be driving one today. 
Um, you need all wheel drive to get up my drive in the winter, but, um, you know, it's fast charging, which maxes out about 54 kilowatts is it's main yeah. drawback. How many EV people of the sort that you and I know and talk to have gotten to a charging station and had the bolt owner angrily tell them, of course it charges faster on a 350 kilowatt than a yeah. 150 kilowatt or yeah. insisted on remaining there until they went from 92% to 100%. You know, people don't know this stuff. We know this. Probably most of the people listening to this know this, but the education part has been historically and continues to be the big deficiency in non-Tesla owners and, frankly, in some Tesla owners too. Um, the guy who bought his Tesla and blithely fast-charged it 100% of the time was not real happy with the result after 40 miles of break. I'm not surprised by that. And I, I think that makes a lot of sense. And I, I completely agree. There's uh, by no means is that system perfect either. And it, it is really interesting. I think there's been a lot of promotions recently that have kind of set some people up for failure and set unrealistic expectations. Um, I think the most recent thing would be what we kind of just saw in Chicago with so many of the chargers being uh, kind of overwhelmed. And a lot of it was rideshare drivers who were yeah. trying this electric car out for free. And unfortunately, it creates a really bad experience for them. It makes it worse for existing EV drivers. And then it becomes a huge media and kind of PR nightmare there. Yeah, uh, But you're totally right around the dealership because I actually even did a podcast about this uh, about a month ago. My mm. mom is looking to buy, uh, she always buys like a new car, like every 10 years or so. And she's finally mm. replacing her Mercedes and she wants to get a new car, but she wants it to be electric. And we test drove a lot of different vehicles. Uh, we went from everything from, a, I mean, she, and she's even a bit like she wants to spend a decent amount of money, like 75, 80. And so she, we've test drove and it's the most she's ever spent on a car, but she plans to have it for at least 10 years. And so we test drove everything from a Rivian to a Mercedes to all these different electrics. And we kind of came back to the Mercedes electric, but it's funny because exactly what you're saying. The weird part was we worked at this, we went to this Mercedes dealership and the guy that helped her was Brian. So he was great, knew all these things about the uh, EQE. My mom was all about it. She came back another time and then she asked for Brian. Well, it turns out there's five different Brian's at this one Mercedes dealership ah. and in just the sales team alone. And I, when I heard that, I was like, I would, even if my name was Brian, I'd come up with like a nickname. I'm just like, I'm Nigel. I don't know anything. Yeah. <laughs> just call me something yeah. so people know who I am. And then fortunately, the third time she goes in, I go in with her and we coincidentally, first person that meets us is as she says, the right Brian. Okay. And um, yeah, he was actually pretty knowledgeable. But then hearing how bad the experience was with this other Brian almost turned my mom off from getting the Mercedes electric altogether, just because knowledge base and everything else was clearly more interested in like trying to sell her an AMG something. And it's just unfortunately an, a huge hurdle. My, the cringiest anecdote I've seen in the last year was, well, but the sales guy said that I could go from 10 to 80% in 28 minutes and I could always charge at home. Both of those things are true independently. They exactly. are not related because if you had a fast charger in your garage, you'd dim your neighborhood lights. Um, <laughs> that said, I am now telling people when you walk into a non-Tesla deal, ask for the EV specialist. If they don't have an EV specialist and they say anyone can answer your questions, find another dealer. And if they say, well, she's not here today, tell them, okay, have her call me and we'll schedule an appointment and walk. No, I, I think that's, that's great. That, that is good feedback. I mean, he, here's what's crazy to me too is... This Mercedes dealership, among other places my mom was shopping, is in the Portland, Oregon area. Yeah. Like as far as being as EV educated as a market as one would expect or it should be, it's still kind of a sad state of reality. Yeah. Um, well, but I actually really like that. that recommendation. Well, to close out and loop back to Nat Teske, which is where we started chatting. Yeah. Perhaps they didn't have the chargeway beacon. Exactly. Um, because, you know, Matt will... Matt has lots of stories about auto salespeople, but the ability to answer those questions with a smartly designed device that says, here's all the charging stations for your specific vehicle. Here's how far you can go. And by the way, if you live in this neighborhood, your utility has this special offer. 
that's stuff that all auto sales right. people ought to be able to do for EVs, and a tiny minority of them can. So, um, and I realize we're coming months, and we'll see if it's changed. Yeah, and I, I mean, I, I also kind of get it from the perspective of the salesperson. They have so much pressure to move cars yep. and yep. do all this stuff, and at the end, like unless you make there more of an incentive for them to sell an electric vehicle. It's going to be really hard for them to Which have to go through all those. Yeah, stiff, the EVs more to reflect the greater amount of time. Yeah. Which then also makes them more expensive to make and sell. Well, it's unclear if anyone's making money on EVs beyond Tesla. Fair point. Fair point. Uh, John, I really have enjoyed this conversation. There was well, a lot more I wanted to cover, but I realize you. we're kind of hit the time that we're allotted. It's so we'll have boring. to have you back. Are we. We didn't even get to talk about uh, your kind of work and fascination with British cars because that's something oh, I also share. Yeah. Um, okay, well, plug number two then. I was, I was going to say, <laughs> let's, let's at least throw it out there. Uh, I want to talk about it more at another point, but let's at least throw it out there. Maybe right. it'll be the teaser for the next time you're on, but tell Perfect. us real quickly about what you're working on. So Tempting Fate Tours, um, youtube.com slash Tempting Fate Tours. Tours. Is, I'll, uh, I'll make sure to put a link in the bio for the podcast. So if anyone's okay. watching this, just go there and we'll have that along with some of these articles you referenced. It's basically my friend Tom and I, and it started when we got bad cabin fever. So we decided to, he's in New Hampshire, I'm in New York. We decided to fly to Portland, buy two Sterlings, a badly built British luxury car from the 80s, and drive them to Radwood, Austin. Polarity ensued. We have several episodes, I think eight or something like that, among them being driving through the desert in Arizona and discovering the event we were going to had been rescheduled eight weeks later. Oh, but, geez. Um, so we have just put up the first video for the next uh, adventure, which happened last September when we took uh, a 69 MGB and a 58 Riley, which I've wow. owned since 1980. Um, on a lemons rally, which is a miles in three days driving through a lot of not very much in Maine. Um, so uh, check it out. We'll have five episodes, one a week. And um, thank you for letting me plug this, which in some ways is more amusing to me than EVs. But um, lots to talk about for both next time. So thank yeah, you. No, for that, that sounds great. And I, I think that is, uh, I mean, Inherently, as someone who works at Car and Driver, you do have to have a soft spot for kind of classic cars and a combustion vehicle. So the EV is a great daily and there's some great sports models, but to have that kind of fun car on the weekend, especially when you can have the time for it to break down and have all of those uh, things that give it character is what makes it. having an EV as your reliable daily vehicle so powerful. But with that, I just want to say thank you so much for being on today, John, and we we'll look forward to talking to you soon. And that brings us to the end of another high voltage episode of the Grid Connections podcast. A huge thank you to our esteemed guest, John Volker, the contributing editor of Car and Driver and just one of the many well-earned titles. I want to just say thanks to him again for joining us today and sharing his invaluable insights on the electric vehicle landscape. From the thrilling test drive of the Lucid Gravity prototype to the critical discussions on the state of EV charging infrastructure in the U.S., it's been a journey packed with knowledge, foresight, and excitement for what the future holds. We hope today's episode charged up your enthusiasm for electric vehicles and provided a clearer view of the road ahead for EV technology and infrastructure. As the EV revolution accelerates, it's conversations like these that illuminate the path forward, sparking ideas and discussion that drive the industry forward. Remember to subscribe to the Great Connections podcast on your favorite podcast platform to stay plugged into the latest developments in the world of electric vehicles. We also love hearing from our listeners, so drop us a review or reach out on social media with your thoughts, questions, or topics you'd like us to explore in future episodes, along with any recommendations for potential future guests. With that, thank you for tuning in and charging forward with us. Until next week, this is the Grid Connections Podcast signing off.